Good afternoon, all. We will get started in just a moment. We are admitting participants now from the waiting room. All right, and it looks like we have gotten people coming in and we'll continue to let them in. I wanna go ahead and get started by welcoming you all. Um, good afternoon, my name is Becky Seabrook and I am the Senior Director of Guest Engagement here at the Health Museum in Houston, Texas. And I am so happy to welcome you all to today's program. Um, this is the first part of our series, Parents Let's Talk Mental Health with Menninger. Um, mental health is such an important topic on a regular basis and after this past year even more so. So um, it's an incredibly relevant discussion to be having and we couldn't be more pleased that we're able to um, to bring this series to you in partnership with the, the Menninger Clinic here in Houston, Texas. I think sometimes we forget just um, how fortunate we are in Houston to have some of the incredible health resources that we do in the community. And the Menninger Clinic is to mental health, what MD Anderson is to, is to cancer care. Um, US News has ranked Menninger as one of the top 10 psychiatric hospitals for 31 consecutive years. And even though it was founded in Kansas 96 years ago, it has been here in Houston since 2003, um, working with Baylor College of Medicine in advancing the standard of uh, mental health care through really innovative treatments research and training. So we are so excited to be partnering with them on this program. Um, a couple of quick notes before we start. Um, today's program um, will begin the conversation uh, with a conversation with, with our guests from Menninger, and then we'll follow that with a Q&A. You are welcome at any point to submit questions that you might have um, if you go to the bottom of your screen, if you hover over the bottom of your screen over Q&A, you'll see where you can go ahead and uh, submit a question. You are welcome to submit it anonymously if you are more comfortable doing so. And um, when we get to the Q&A, we'll be going ahead and, and answering those questions. Um, we will also be recording this session um, just to make it available as a resource for those that were not able to join us here today. So with that, I think I would, I would love to get started. Um, today's topic is beyond COVID, coping re-entry re into community. It's a topic that's on all of our minds um, and this sort of new normal that we have, or we're trying to get back to some sense of normalcy and, and what that looks like. And to do that, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. John Stevens. Um, Dr. Stevens, welcome. Um, he's the medical director. Thanks, <laughs> yeah, for outpatient services and admissions and vice president of growth and innovation at the Menninger Clinic. He is a physician and is board certified in adult as well as child and adolescent psychiatry. He came to Menninger in 2015 to relaunch outpatient services at the clinic. And he and his team have built an array of innovative programs to serve um, patients in the community and, and even in their own homes. So uh, Dr. Stevens, Welcome, thank you so much for being here today. And at this point, I will turn it over to you to introduce our other guest. Yes, thank you, uh, Becky. Thank you, the Health Museum and everyone who's made this possible. I'm really looking forward to emceeing this important series to talk about mental health issues because we're really at a watershed moment in terms of coming out of a year long pandemic and the effect that has had not only on our general medical health, but our mental health. So I'm very pleased to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Angela Kareth. Angela is a licensed professional counselor with over 15 years of clinical experience. At Menninger, she's the program manager of our Bel Air location right off of 610. Uh, she specializes in supporting healthy family relationships and working with individuals who are regaining confidence and trying to motivate to achieve their own life goals, as well as addressing uh, stress in a healthy way. Uh, Angela and the wonderful team at Bel Air of mental health professionals work with adolescents. Uh, just like to point out that they launched a new after school program for adolescents uh, to help parents and teens have a place for healing, learning how to cope in this very difficult time, as well as embracing positive changes for the future. So uh, Angela, I'm really looking forward to your talk. Please take it away. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. Just gonna share my screen. Can you all see that? Looks good. Okay, thank you. 
So I am excited to be here. Um, I appreciate the Health Museum partnering with us at Menninger um, to talk about a topic that is dear um, to our hearts, uh, mental health. Um, and I'm glad we have a platform today to promote prevention, um, strategies for prevention and continuing to break the silence uh, and stigma um, of getting mental health care. So <clears throat> as parents, what's our job? Our job is not to love our children. That happens automatically. From the moment we know that we're having children, um, them growing inside of them, we start loving them. Our job is really to um, start learning to protect them and prepare them for the world beyond us. Um, it's to raise them to be happy, healthy, successful children, teens, and later adults. Our responsibility is to help those kids, our kids, thrive and survive in their lives. Um, I always say to parents, think about it as um, they're in driving school with us when we're parenting them, or they're um, bumpers when you think about um, a bowling alley. Our job is to guide them as they figure out how to drive in their lives and how they figure out how to roll the balls um, down the lane. So we actually are there um, to guide them where they start building some confidences in their own lives. Um, they're learning to walk through whatever emotions they are, figuring out how to cope in their lives. And all of this is helping them build resiliency. Um, and figuring out how they're gonna manage stress wars in their life. So what is mental health? Um, according to the American Psychological Association, it's a state of mind characterized by emotional well-being, good behavioral adjustment, relative freedom from anxiety or disabling symptoms, and a capacity to establish constructive, healthy relationships and cope with ordinary demands and stresses of life. Um, this last year, many of us, if we had mental health issues or didn't, was probably our mental health was likely affected. So how has the app pandemic impacted us? I'm going to gear my kind of talk, talk today about towards kids and teens. Um, so academically, what did we see? We saw kids schooling in their PJs, rolling out of bed a minute before they went online. We then saw kids um, having a hybrid, going to school and doing things online if there was an outbreak. We saw some kids go back. Um, we saw kids snacking all day. We saw kids eating lunch at 10 o'clock. My sixth grader is eating at 10, so when he comes home, he's starving. Um, part of that is the schools are figuring out how to um, have infection control. We saw kids do homework or don't do homework. Um, we saw testing online um, versus in person. Um, there were open boat, open book tests, there were closed book tests. The world and academics looked very different. Um, what we know is virtual learning is probably here to stay. Um, one of the biggest concerns I hear parents talk about is the academic gap. Kids haven't been either in school for a year and or longer, a year and a half. So everyone's worried. Students are worried, parents are worried, um, schools are worried. What does this gap look like? Um, but the thing that I tell parents is everyone has experienced this. Everyone's in the same boat. Um, here in Texas, here in our nation, globally, everyone is essentially having to look at these learning gaps and they will in the coming years. The biggest recommendation here is not to cram. People think about, okay, we've missed a year. Let's get ready by the next three months in summer. Let's get kids going back to tutoring or let's do workbooks. So we talk about a slow ramp up, a gradual movement, not to overwhelm our kids or anxiously worry them, but how do we slowly integrate some learning even through the summer so that we can help. Um, as parents, um, being one myself um, and having to teach um, at home, which I'm not a teacher, um, especially with my own kids, but I saw some of their strengths and weaknesses. So we have a better sense, parents, um, to collaborate with schools and even with our students. I think it's a three-way conversation, a three-way partnership to talk about how we are going to um, adjust um, with these new learning styles and how we get back into the classroom to um, help with that gap. 
The other thing about going back to school, it's not just about academics, it's about social engagement and emotional uh, engagement. How do we help our kids um, get back? Many haven't seen their friends, haven't been back on a baseball team or uh, at a school club or back in band practice. So this new year is going to come with lots of challenges and maybe anxieties. Um, and so I always tell parents, in which I thought the school did a remarkable job, my daughter had a play date on the school playground where socially distanced kids ate, had popsicles or was able to see their friends, um, but it helped my daughter go to school. She didn't feel awkward not going into a classroom, not knowing anybody, but knowing, oh, I saw that kid or I met that. So I encourage parents to think about how can we safely um, promote kids having play dates again. Um, going back to a baseball team, um, thinking about going to camp. Who did they go to camp with two years ago where we can do some virtual connecting um, or safe play dates that will help them be less anxious as they reintegrate into these things. We also learned this last year, um, our brains need breaks. Uh, we need mental breaks. There, there was a lot of talks of mental health days. So as we reintegrate, I want us to also remember parents and kids need to have um, breaks and have fun and learn to relax um, and figure out ways that they can manage and cope with their stress. So social impacts, um, academic impacts, um, the biggest things that people, students cited was it was difficult to or get their work organized poor time management, um, turning things in late, uh, things popped up on their screen saying this is overdue, um, not knowing how to manage new ways of doing exam taking um, and uh, being able to manage those deadlines. So those were a lot of the major adjustments um, or stressors that kids talked about, but one of the biggest adjustments was learning how to navigate new learning. Um, I had a kindergarten working on an iPad um, and would have meltdowns when the Wi-Fi went down. So again, I think this is a learning curve and she is much stronger a year and a half later. Older kids are also at this time dealing with other things. You know, there is this uh, high expectation and pressure to succeed academic competition that was there pre-pandemic. Um, I feel like that was a little lightened in this last year, but as schools reopen, as we reintegrate, we will likely see that pressure come back. And so how are we gonna manage that? How are we gonna help our students manage that? So, so some social impacts um, that have happened during this year is changes in routines. Um, schools look different. Um, sports look different. Um, going to church or not going to church, all of that looks very, very different. So our routine is essentially uh, different and there's adjustments to that. There were also major life, significant life events that happened. We had uh, driveway birthday parties and Zoom holidays. Um, there were graduations that were not in person. Proms, kids missed out on proms and football games and homecomings. There was a lot of first going your first day to elementary school or middle school or high school or even going off to college all looked very different this last year and might look different next year. So how, how do we um, anticipate and prepare for that? There was things like deaths. People have lost um, teachers or other students or family members um, uh, due to COVID or not. Um, and a lot of times we were not able to be able to celebrate those lives. Um, um, and I think it's important to be able to recognize that was hard. Um, there were also relationship changes. Our kids did not engage with their friends for a majority of this last year. Dating relationships look different. Being on sports teams look different. We were with our families 24 seven um, and that looked very different pre-pandemic. So what were the mental health kind of things that uprose? Fear, worry, and concern was um, on the front end a lot of other things, um, <clears throat> psychological impacts was elevated rates of stress, anxiety. Uh, our routines were different, levels of lots of loneliness, depression, harmful use of alcohol um, or drug use, 
um, self-harm and suicidal behaviors um, were at all time increase. And then there was a lot of grief and trauma that people felt. So remember our kids in this day and age were not only dealing with the pandemic, there was a lot of other scary things happening in our world. Um, we were dealing with political and social issues. Um, here in Houston, uh, a couple of years ago, we had a big uh, natural disaster like Hurricane Harvey. But even as of February of this year, we had the winter storms. So our kids have had a lot of exposure to an unscary world, things that feel unsafe and threatening. So I think one of the biggest things as parents, when it, we might need to be mindful, it was hard on us as adults, uh, let alone adolescents or children. So make sure that we are thinking about having lots of patience and grace, um, keeping in mind they deal with things very differently than we do. Um, I remember my daughter who was young saw the win uh, Harvey and um, when there was big storms right after Harvey, she's like, do we have to go to our uncle's house? Is our streets going to flood? So I think being mindful of we know how to handle things, they might not. So what are some warning signs? If your child is experiencing some mental health issues, here are some warning signs. Um, some reoccurring fears. How about if something happens to you? Um, how about if you're not there? How about if grandma gets COVID? Um, irritability, restlessness, outbursts, being keyed up, feeling sad or low moods, um, avoiding things that they used to enjoy, wanted, used to love baseball, not interested, um, not wanting to go back to school, avoiding that. Um, drops in grades. For kids, their job is really to do school. So if we see that they're missing assignments, can't get school, want to avoid, an AB student slips down to a CD student, um, trouble sleeping, sleeping all the time. Um, we see that they're using substances or increased use in substances, doing risky things like cutting, um, that their little kids complain a lot of times of stomach aches and headaches. Um, there's a lot of exhaustion, fatigue, physical complaints. So things to keep in mind. So we all get stressed, we all get anxious, we all have down days, we get sad, we get frustrated. Those are all normal. Uh, when it feels problematic or out of sorts is when our stress, anxiety, emotions like sadness and frustration and anger don't go away in a couple of days or a couple of weeks, that it's staying longer. Um, and then things, it prevents us from doing our daily activities, taking care of ourselves, taking showers, going to school, um, wanting to hang out with friends or being in social groups, um, a level of lack of enjoyment, things that we enjoy, even foods or restaurants or um, uh, hanging out with our friends, not enjoying those things. And there is an increased level of avoidance. Um, they don't wanna go to school. They don't wanna see their friends. Um, they don't want to do anything um, other than being at home or being with us, a lot of clinginess. So that's when we might see that there is more of a problem or a bigger problem. So I think it's good to know some coping skills. These are methods that people use to deal with stressful situations. Um, some healthy coping skills is making sure we're eating healthy meals, limiting our caffeine and sugars, making sure our kids are getting outdoors, exercising, um, abstaining um, and not using substances, um, limiting our technology, that there is a balance. They're hanging out and socializing with their friends on video games, but also hanging out shooting baskets outside of our home, um, that they have a good sleep routine and that they're connecting with their peers um, and family members. Those are good coping. Coping strategy is an action and a series of actions or a thought process used um, in meeting a stressful or unpleasant situation. Um, coping strategies typically involve conscious um, and direct approaches to problems. So as a therapist, we teach our kiddos, our adolescents, um, our clients, lots of coping strategies. And some of that includes, how do you talk about your problem? Um, when you do get anxious or stressed out or angry, what are some skills that you can implement? Deep breathing, um, if you're anxious saying out loud, I can handle this, um, muscle tensions, 
clenching our hands and releasing it, um, meditation and mindfulness, um, breaking down a big task into uh, manageable chunks, teaching skills like conflict and um, problem solving skills, visualizing. A lot of times uh, with kids, we talk about, okay, what would it be like going back to school? What are you worried about? What if Susie doesn't talk to you? What could you do? What could you say? Kind of helping them through those things um, is a really good strategy. A lot of times we make things bigger in our own minds and talking about it or figuring out a plan um, is helpful. Sometimes just distracting, um, that feeling is there and maybe I could go do a chore. Let me clean the kitchen. Let me go organize my um, office. Um, let me put my shoes together. Um, shoes in order. Um, and sometimes I tell kids, try to go do your homework. Um, other things like doing things that they enjoy, go listen to relaxing music and watch a funny show. Um, those are some other things that uh, we say is good. Journaling. So for us to be able to help our kids, it is really important that parents um, are healthy themselves. I will say in this last year, um, well, I have seen more parents than I have actually adolescents because parents need support. And what I find is if parents are healthy, they're better able and equipped to handle the pressures that their kids are going through. So, you know, the added thing of the oxygen mask, put the oxygen mask on yourself. If you're healthy and happy and working and coping, you're gonna be able to help your kids and teens who are struggling. Manage your own stress. Um, talk to other parents. Cultivate a village. Um, we're human. Reminding ourselves we're doing the best that we can. Um, this we're being we're good enough. Those are really important things that we need to make sure that we um, remind ourselves of. Um, just like we want to make sure our kids are taken care of, I tell parents. When was the last time you had a physical? When was the last time you exercised? When was the last time you saw friends? When was the last time um, you took a mental health, health day. Um, reminding ourselves um, and role modeling um, healthy behaviors is really important. And the other thing is there's a lot to worry about, especially as we re-enter, but I think there are these moments that we have had and we will have of being present with our kids. And I think it's important um, to get out of our heads and really be mindful and present with our own children. Um, how do we watch that movie with our kid? How do we go on a walk um, with our kids and enjoy? We have them, again, essentially for um, 17 to 18 years. How do we make sure that we're making memories with them? We're building rapport and connection. So I think it's really important, parents, that you have your own self-care systems um, and that you're practicing them. Um, for me, this last year, I would put a sign outside of my office Mommy's working. I'll open the door if you need me. My kids knew when I went to my bedroom at the end of the evening, hey, this is mommy time. Um, if you have a partner, how do you um, share with your partner? You need a break. If you don't have a partner, how do you have a village of either friends or teammate moms um, or dads, um, family members that can tag in that you can get that rest and respite? How do you teach your kids? Let's cook together. Why don't you cook today? Let's do laundry. Why don't you do laundry? This is a great time to be teaching them um, to take some things off of our plates. There are no perfect parents. There are no perfect children, but there are a lot of plenty perfect moments along the way. So I want you to really grasp that. That's a great quote that I saw. So things that you can do parents when it comes to helping your kids um, how do you remind them and communicate that you love them and you care for them and you're there when they get overwhelmed or stressed knowing that, hey, you're um, an ally um, or thought, making sure that they know grandma is, other adults are, school counselors are. Um, if they are struggling um, to uh, manage their stress, teaching them the skills. Uh, and advocating, would you like to go see a therapist? Would it be helpful to um, have additional tutoring? Um, helping monitor electronic use or social media, the news, those are other things. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there. If they have questions, I think it's important for us to give them 
um, the correct information. Um, encourage them to um, be physical, get physical activity, get nutrition, sleep. That's all really, really important. And the biggest thing I think is celebrate small um, steps in the right direction. I will give my patients virtual high fives. I say, oh my God, I'm doing a virtual uh, backflip in my you know, head. That's so awesome. They need to hear us um, encourage them and um, show them that we are there to support them. These are just some other ways for parents. One of the biggest things I tell parents, remember we're scaffolds. Um, the child is the building, we are their framework. We're there to protect them um, as they rise um, and to think about how are we structuring, supporting them? How do we create structure for them and consistency? Um, and how are we encouraging them? A big thing, as bad as a pandemic was with isolation, social distancing, shutdowns, um, worried and fearful of getting COVID, uh, wondering if there was going to be a, a vaccine, we did learn a lot of other lessons. It taught us um, this concept of resiliency. We saw lots of families and even kids and even parents um, learn this um, um, word, resiliency, which is bounce back. How did we bounce back? Um, and they were able to draw back on skills that they had in the past or learn some new skills that they will be able to that showed that they dealt with things in 2020 and will in their futures. So I think as we reopen, I want families to think about pre-pandemic resiliency, pandemic re resiliency, um, and what's important as we move forward. Um, I personally felt like we were warped back into my childhood. We did a lot more things with my kids. I We had family dinners more often. Um, uh, we played outside, we slowed down, um, we cooked together as a family, we got to know our neighbors, um, we did family road trips. So some of all of that, we will likely take in and kids learned other things. Um, and so these are some of the things that I heard um, families share that they um, do. And I think these are things that we need to consist consider as we reopen. Um, there was a sense of shared experience through the last year people validating how they were feeling, um, getting kind of a sense of safety and fear. Um, there was this collective commiserating and celebrating. So I think that should be definitely a part of our mindset as we reintegrate. Um, what I love is that there is much more pandemic brought the topic of mental health um, to the forefront from being something that was silenced or a stigma um, I am seeing all over social media, all over the news, in any art, uh, magazine or article that you open, people are talking about it and re recognizing uh, mental health. It doesn't matter who you are, what you look like, how much money you have in the bank account, um, what your culture or background, mental health affects, um, it can affect anyone and everyone. And the cool thing is I have parents calling my office and saying, my, my son has asked me to set up an appointment with a therapist. So this is being talked about in schools, or this is a good thing about social media, that they might see people getting help. And I think we need to continue encouraging that. There's a high percent of individuals with diagnosable mental health disorders. Um, and the biggest thing here is um, there's help out there. There's treatment. Um, so I think we should be much more open to accessing help um, and getting the help that we need. This is some, if you do need more help um, and talking to your kiddos, um, what is the help that we need? Um, it might just be school related and we might need an academic coach or a tutor, um, therapies um, from a family counselor to going to group therapy where you have a uh, uh, therapy with peers your own age, um, individual one-on-one -on -one where you do talk therapy, but also learn some skills, how to manage your emotions. Um, and then there's medication if that's needed. So I suggest, you know, there's a lot of help out there and kind of find it, trying to find the right one uh, might be daunting, um, but there's lots of ways to do that. Uh, and it might take a little bit of legwork and uh, research. 
So as I wrap up, parents, I want you to think about three things. Um, I call it the three C's of parenting, especially as we um, re-enter. Um, if you don't remember anything from today's um, talk, I want you to remember these three things. Um, communicate, cultivate, think about cultivating an environment in our homes where feelings and opinions and thinking is allowed. Collaborate with your teens, with your schools, with mental health provider. Think of this as a teamwork approach in um, raising our children. Um, listen, give them forced choices, formulate a plan with their buy-in. And finally, care. Create a loving, safe, supportive home and beyond. Let them know that you're there for them, um, that they have others there for them. And if they're struggling, um, that we will get them the help that they need. Um, and when they do ask for that help, let's get it for them. These are some resources um, and I'll, I'll keep that as something that you guys can share. I am ready for some questions. Well, thank you so much, Angela. It was wonderful. And I wanted that slide deck because I want to steal some. I love the Jeopardy like screens uh, for some of those tips to, to have that as a, as a cheat sheet when parents are asking me the same kind of questions. I, I wrote several questions down that I wanted to ask you and I knew what your, the topic was. And I think it's a sign of a great talk that you kind of answered most of them along the way. But luckily, our audience has a couple of questions that I didn't think of. So I'm going to start there. I uh, hope Becky won't mind me going out of order um, and looking at some of these questions. And the first is from an anonymous person. It says, as a parent, I'm trying to figure out how to manage differences in opinion on masks and vaccines with people we're interacting with. How do we help our kids navigate this? You know, the guidance has shifted and there's been a lot of, of controversy, unfortunately, sometimes political controversy about uh, masks and, and, and that with, with kids. Without getting into maybe specifics, how do you help families understand that and negotiate that conflict, especially now, you know, there's some good news on the rise and yesterday, one of the vaccines was approved down to 12 years old. That still leaves a lot of children um, not able to get vaccinations. But when people, I've had many parents ask me, you know, they want to increase socialization, but what about around families that where a child is not wearing a mask or some families that are very strict about that? I don't know if you've had that in your office and, and maybe what are some of the advice you, you'd give them about managing that differences in whether or not to get a vaccine whether or not to wear a mask in, let's say, an outdoor environment, et cetera? So I think it's based on some of our own research, what is coming out. And I think what's fortunate or unfortunate is it's changing. So knowing that we can only make the best decisions with the information that we have right now. Um, I also know that it's very important to feel comfortable, right? Um, and what's gonna give you that comfortability? If you have a trusted relationship with a doc, if your pediatrician, how do you get the facts from a medical provider to make your own informed decision? Even with that, you might still struggle with, am I really okay giving my kid a vaccine or not? And I think it's really based on um, uh, a lot of factors and based on, I think part of it is your comfort level. It's also talking to your child. I remember my my son wanted to go to school last fall and I was very uncomfortable. I said, let's just wait till January. But he advocated for himself. Yeah. And I said, mm, okay, he wants to. He does better face to face. And we saw his grade slip. So we said, okay, let's try it. He's advocating, but we had rules, forced rules. Mm -hmm. You gotta make sure you have your mask. You're gonna have to come home and take a shower, right? Like there was things that made us move a little bit. So I think it's a flexible conversation. Um, and comfort level. Um, but I, I tell families all the time, let's do your research. What you decide today can be changed. Um, we can change our minds. Um, and if there are other kids without masks and you want your kids with masks, I think that's, as a parent, our job goes back to that protecting. This is what we need to do. You can have that socialization, but you got to have your mask on. Um, as parents, we get to be decisive. Yeah, I don't know about you. I've seen, I think sometimes the kids, and I have three young children, once they got used to that habit, they, they're they better with it than many adults that I see in my office where it's it's hanging below the nose or it's hanging as like a chin strap. Yeah. So I think sometimes kids almost respond better to change than maybe we do as adults. But They will um, tell me, mom, we're in the car. We went to the store. Where's the sanitizer? Like they, they are much, they're more advocates and proactive, I would say. 
Another question from Holly uh, is more personal, but I think, uh, it, I think it'd be helpful. I noticed that my 12 year old isn't reaching out to friends who live nearby, who she could um, hang out with outdoors. Uh, I think she's lost some social skills and confidence over the last year. How could I support her without taking over? Uh, should I set up the hangouts with parents or is that too much? It's kind of a personal question, but we have a lot. You talked about scaffolding and, and doing that. Where, where is the, the line between scaffolding and helicopter parenting in your view? Well, and I think this is going to be a time for really adjustments, right? We've been some a year, some 18 months, some almost going on two years of being out of the loop. So I think it is okay. I think it's uh, when our kids are struggling, this is when we lean in a little bit and we might say, hey, neighbor down the street, let's get our kids outside at the same time. And let's see if we can, you remember those bumpers, let's create and cultivate some kind of experiences. But hopefully from there, they see each other and they'll say hello or, hey, isn't that Susie? You wanna say hi, right? I think we need to retrain our kids, right? They've been out of the game, just like when we're going back to the gym, it's going to take a little while. There might be some growing pains, um, but I think it is okay to set that up and start cultivating. We could also say, hey, what do you think? You know, uh, who would you want to invite over, right? Get them to initiate some thought process and um, some ideas themselves. But I think it is hard. It is socially awkward when people haven't seen each other, especially kids. You don't know what to say. You don't know what to do. So I think it's a good opportunity, especially in the summer, to start helping them build back those skills. Okay. So the summer, I'm getting a lot of questions from parents about this summer. So, okay. You know, we recognize those outdoor environments are likely much safer than indoor environments. And the, you know, wiping every plastic bag down when you come back from HEB, maybe not so hot, you know, not necessary anymore. We've had to accommodate. But I'm getting a lot of questions from parents about how to avoid what they call the summer slide. And I know you know what this is, is this big gap between the end of the academic year, which for some kids is coming up in a week or two, and then the beginning of the next academic year. And this huge amount of unstructured time between in the middle. So how do you help parents who are worried about their children really going into a big funk or just having no structure in the summer slide um, that we, you know, after this kind of very unusual year that we've been with? Um, any thoughts on that? I know you must be getting questions because I'm getting it all the time. Should they go to a camp, should, uh, let alone an away camp? Should they stay home? What kind of activities are safe? And then academically, how to, how to keep any positive momentum going? So again, I think it's a, a conversation for the kids, uh, with the kids. Um, I know some kids that are ready. They're like, I want to go away to camp and parents are ready to send their kids away, right? So in those situations, that's fine as long as we're comfortable and we know the safety measures and things like that. I also think we don't, we need to monitor our own anxieties um, and not overdo it, right? Like there are little ways to um, help kids with academic. Hey, you know, would you like to go to a week long camp instead of tutoring all summer long? Um, it could be, um, we'll take June off, but starting in July, we're gonna do some academic coaching, right? Um, it could be also an opportunity if we saw our kids that are more quiet, more reserved, had met, uh, met, uh, meltdowns, maybe we need to get them into a social group. If it's group therapy or talking to a therapist about their anxiety, and if they do have that, how do we use this opportunity to plant those seeds? Um, I say slow integration. Kids are looking forward to yippee, I have the summer off, I get to sleep in, I don't have to wake up at 7.30. So I think it's okay to let them sleep in, but not till noon, right? I think it's okay for them to have video games, but have some balance. Again, have their friends come over versus always on virtual um, on video games. So I think it's gonna take a conversation and finding buy-in from them. Um, I think that would be a really good thing. Um, Again, if we tell them to do it and they don't, it's just going to be a big conflict and we don't get anywhere. So I think having conversations and figuring out what your child might need. Um, they, the research says, do some reading, go to the library, go to a bookstore, get them to read fun stuff. Mm -hmm. We can make their vacations um, uh, educational. Go to the health museum, go to the zoo, right? There's some cool things in Houston that we can get our kids to do and just get their brains kind of going. Um, so I think those are some of the things that I would say. Um, well, I think 
what you're saying is getting to is answering maybe another anonymous question that came in. And I realize when we're talking about camps and some of these things, they are those kind of extracurriculars are expensive. And along with the the health toll of COVID, now approaching 600,000 deaths in the United States. We're talking about the mental health toll that I think we, we are seeing as clinicians, both at Menninger and, and just seeing with our neighbors and loved ones. But someone writes, TV can be so influential with kids. Disney World is really, really promoting taking a big family trip. If that isn't financially feasible, what approach can a parents take without letting down the kids? Obviously, this question to me reminded me there's been a significant financial toll for many families. There's still 8 million fewer jobs in the United States economy currently today than pre-COVID. Many families have, uh, many jobs have been displaced. Many people are just not, are not well enough to go back to work or afraid of the, the work consequences, you know, the risk of COVID. That's a question. If it isn't, I think you're starting to answer it. So I want to get back to that. If it, it's not financially feasible, and, and child saying you want to go to Disney World, Disneyland, I think Disneyland just opened at 25% and you just can't swing it. How do you talk to a child about that so they could they could hear it? So I think part of it is hearing, hearing them, their excitement, right? But also that they might be disappointed. It's okay that you know you're you feel like it's unfair, validating their feelings of their disappointment, their upsetness, but being able to say to them, we love you. Um, and we want to get there, right? Giving them some hope of in the future, maybe next year, um, and not shutting that door down. Um, is there ways? I know we had, um, with the pandemic, there was a lot of things that we could do virtually, right? And mm -hmm. so I think it's like being able to have a buy-in. Well, let's start doing some research now that we can go next summer, right? What would you want to do next summer? So it doesn't take away from the spirit of what that is. And what can we do this summer? It's not Disney World, but last year we made a lot of accommodations and kids were able to have fun. My own kids, they're like, what, go camping? <laughs> like they, and one of the biggest things that they found out was camping and fishing was actually fun, right? And a lot more of them were able to say for their birthday, they wanted a fishing trip. And I said, I never thought one of my kids would say that, right? So hmm. I think being able to explore with them, we might not, have it today and validate their feeling of disappointment or but helping them understand remember last year we had to make some accommodations because the world shut down right well this year because daddy and mommy don't have work or we have decided um, to stay home with you right we're gonna make we're gonna want that later but for right now this is what we can do yeah. you're kind of saying it and i'm thinking about it are, are you hearing from families as, as things slowly reopen or for some more rapidly reopen of things we want to keep from pandemic life and maybe don't want to go back to pre-pandemic life? Um, anything that you're hearing frequently or anything that you might consider? Uh, you talked about fishing trips. I myself have been to the Galveston Pier a couple of times. Didn't think I would ever be doing that, putting, you know, dead fish on a hook. But there I was to try to be the, you know, my, my kids want to do that. It felt safe. It was outdoors. Anything, anything other than fishing that you could uh, think of that will be something we want to keep from uh, yeah. pandemic life. I have a lot of families, even my own, will say, "I want to keep Taco Tuesday, right? Like if it's okay. a meals, you know, supper Sundays, right? Like having some fun things like that." Um, they have been zooming with extended family, so we've talked about how do you continue that, or think about incorporating a road trip to go see a family member or a. Mm -hmm that they've been Zooming with, but haven't seen in person. Um, so I think there are lots of things like that. I think the kids in my neighborhood, the boys like to play basketball or stick mm -hmm. baseball in the streets. Um, my daughter and her uh, friends down the street are now biking together, right? Um, and parents are coming out um, more regularly just to watch their kids and connect. And I think those are some things that we want to keep. Um, I think people going out and hiking and doing nature walks and um, thinking about when they're making trips this year, they're including those things. So I think there's, um, I, I think it's very a good thing to be mindful and think about. And you might ask your kids, what'd you like? What'd you enjoy? Um, and my daughter will say, I like doing chalk art on the yeah. driveway, right? And my son might have something else. My husband might have something else. So I think it's collectively asking your family, what would you like to keep? I think one of the questions here 
kind of got back to something I was thinking about when you're saying, okay, a Disney World trip can be postponed. But there is also, and I'll read the question, then I'll kind of put my two cents. I feel like there's a lot of emphasis on finding silver linings and resiliency. And I'm glad you said that because that's easier than thinking of all we've lost. But um, there is a lot of that, I think, right now. How do you balance this with the very real experience of loss and grief and the need to acknowledge that? This is Naz for, for parents or kids. I'll give some examples to flesh that out. You could talk about postponing a Disney World or Disneyland trip for another year. But for some last year, they didn't have a, they didn't get to walk in their cap and gown. They didn't have prom. Um, for many of their first year, I know this is a little bit older than the kids we've been talking about, didn't really have a normal first year of college or, or getting into the workforce, or frankly, even dating has been very abnormal for many people. You can't get all of that back. How do you counsel people that you talk with and families on coping with that loss and maybe even that grief? So I think the biggest thing is being able to validate that loss. It's it's true. They they lost some important things. If we think about our graduations or our proms and all right. the things that came with it, right? We can have some empathy and sympathize and have apathy for them, right? Like we can understand that were major losses. Um, so I think for them to be able to just share that out loud, have a space to be able to share that and hear, have people hear them, right? That does suck, right? Um, I know with my adolescents or young adults that are um, were graduating, um, that were, were huge uh, things. And we might have talked about it for weeks on end. And I have parents saying, when are they going to get over it, right? When are they going to get over it? But I think it's being able to say, they got to get over it when they're ready to get over it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and us being pushy on that and being dismissive doesn't help. Being able to create a space, um, letting them feel heard will help help in the healing process. So validating their feelings, um, encouraging them to figure out, maybe there are ways, you're not gonna be able to have the big graduation, but maybe we can have a small graduation. What were the ways that we were able to celebrate you and your accomplishments? It's not just about the pretty dress, but um, you know um, about the occasion, about you getting a driver's license. And I had, I saw daughters get dressed up and dads do dances in their um, living rooms. It wasn't the same, but the kids felt, you hear me, you see me. And we, they had family members do graduations um, in, uh, you know, the back backyard. So it, it, we will never be able to give them that occasion, but there are ways to help that kind of landing soft. Yeah, I wonder if, not to be Pollyanna-ish, but whether this will be a defining for these for young people, a defining kind of uh, event in their life. Uh, my grandmother is 102 years old, and I still feel like the depression in World War II for her was defining. And 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 she loves being part of the greatest generation. Um, now that was a lot longer than even COVID, and 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 for some maybe had more deprivation. At least that's the way she says it. But it really defined who she was as an individual. I, I think we've seen that. I've seen patients along the years of the Vietnam War, um, September 11th, and Iraq and Afghanistan War. I wonder for this generation whether COVID could be something that would be defining, but hopefully in a positive way. For my grandmother, it, it definitely was, uh, but it influenced the way she interacted with the world and certainly with money and uh, material things. I just wonder if there will be a similar consequence for this generation. Not a question, more of a comment. I want to get to a couple more questions because I think we're running out of time. And there's some really good questions. Thank you, everyone. Another personal uh, uh, question from Anonymous. I found that I need a lot more downtime and alone time to manage my own stress. And that's translated into more screen time, screen time for the kids. And I feel torn about this. I'm probably not alone and I'm conflicted. Suggestions welcome. I could have written that one too. I didn't, but I feel the same, the screen time uh, when you can't necessarily, uh, certainly earlier in the pandemic, when going outside didn't feel as safe to just play basketball, um, seemed to increase for a lot of kids. But you talk about self-care for parents. How do you balance those? Um, I can empathize with that question myself, right? Being a mental health professional, many of us can. And I think there is a lot of re research about this new word language, right? We've been in this giving as parents, we're in, I want to sort of say service field, right? Like we are always giving to our kids. If we're working, we're giving to our jobs, to our spouses, right? So I think it's, again, we have to be able to do the best, give ourselves permission to say we're doing the best that we can. 
Um, so I've learned, and this is really hard for even me to put that sign out there that have taught my kids, hey, mommy needs a break too, right? I will say, I'll tag my husband and say, I'm going for a walk, you got the kids, right? I think it's being able to say, if we give them an extra 30 minutes of screen time because we need to go read a book or go watch our own shows, that is okay. We're in a place that we need to figure out how we're going to survive and thrive. And a lot of times I find when we take that mental health day or when our kids are in school and we take a half day for ourselves, we find the energies that we will get back to being better parents to our kids. So reminding yourself and when you feel guilty, I think that's the word I hear lots of parents say, I feel guilty, this is so bad, they're back on their screens. I think being able to say, okay, and, when, and they're not on their screens and you're with them and you're really checked out or you're screaming at right. them, how is that going to help, right? Like you're going to be feeling guilty for not being a good parent in that situation. So I think being able to give yourself permission and finding what works for you, but we need respite. I would tell you that over and over again. I tell parents all the time, find your uh, place of re-energy. Well, Becky, if I have, could have one more question for, for Angela, she's such a wonderful uh, therapist, counselor, really a couples therapist, family therapist, you do it all, Angela. How does a parent out listening today or listening in the future uh, on the readcast, uh, how do they know they need to meet with someone like you, that the child needs professional help and how do they access that? Someone already asked, can you please put that resources slide up again? Uh, we'll have this as a tape so you could go and look at that. Maybe there's other ways to, to, to share that. But how do you know, again, if someone, if a child, if, if there's a red flag and needs mental help? Professional. Sure. A lot of times the kids are telling us themselves and we might feel awkward or uncomfortable. But if they are saying they want help, get them help, right? It's pretty easy and simple. Um, people ask all the time, where do I get help? It's very daunting. It's still, there's a big stigma. Talking to your pediatrician, talking to your school counselor, talking to your church minister. Um, these are places where we get referrals. People are saying, I, I, I heard about you through my church. I heard about you through my youth minister, um, my baseball coach, right? The word is getting around. And a lot of times therapy is such a personal relationship. You have to figure out, does the therapist work with children? Is this really about a, a kid issue or am I exhausted and I need my own therapy? So kind of the way that we work at Bel Air is even if you call about your kids, we don't just take you the child, we take the entire family system. Um, and we try to help everyone in the family that is um, whoever's struggling, how to support that person that's struggling. Um, if you're struggling, giving you the skills um, and giving psychoeducation, how do I help my child? Um, and part of that includes, you might need your own therapy. Um, what's a good route? Do, does my kid need medicine? Does he need testing? Does he need a tutor? But finding a professional that works with children um, and asking around. There are lots of places in Houston. Houston in the last 20 years has boomed to have lots of resources, which is a good problem to have. Um, and then finding them, um, reaching out to professionals and say, can I chat with you for five or 10 minutes? Can I, you know, um, ask you a few questions? This is what's going on. What do you think? Um, and I've turned away people and said, your kid doesn't need therapy. They need an actually an academic coach or, mm. hey, have you tried these few uh, coping strategies um, yourselves um, and come back in a month if things don't get better? Well, Karina helped us out by saying there is a free warm line in Houston so parents can find mental health providers at the Houston Hope Line at 832-831-7337. Uh, thank you, Karina, for, for saying that. Uh, I just want to thank you, Angela. What a way to kick off this series. I'm really excited about it. I wish I didn't go next week because <laughs> now you set like a really high bar and that's going to be a challenge, but I'll do my best. Uh, Becky, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Angela, for sharing all these wonderful tips and helps and a wonderful presentation as well as the resources. Absolutely. I want to echo that sentiment, Angela. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with, with us and, and with everyone on the call today. Um, and also the people that may be watching this after the fact. Um, Dr. Stevens, thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to on our conversation on the brain and mental health next uh, next Thursday at noon. Um, and then as you mentioned, uh, there's a number of sessions in the series, including one that's coming up in July on championing minority mental health. So for anyone that's interested in 
and finding out more about what some of the sessions are, you can always go to the healthmuseum.org and look under our programs and classes tab and you'll, you'll see the Menninger Mental Health Series there. So again, thank you both so much. Thank you for all of you that are joining us today and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank Bye. you.